saved my soul, and two days later, he saved me. Praise Amen? Amen. So I just love how God, perfect timing, um, went to East Bladen this Friday, pointed down the road where I was rolling up some marijuana, but God was just beating on my heart that night. And then that Sunday, gave my life to the Lord six years ago. And um, I've never been the same. Amen, church? Amen. And uh, that's what happened, and that's what happens when God gets a hold of your life. And you know, again, you've heard me say this several times, you don't got to have a background like me, you just need to be a sinner. 
If you go study the book of Romans, all have sinned against the glory of God. So that means this. All of us in this room need a, a Savior. Amen? Amen? So church, can we give a God a hand that he redeems you? I was hearing the, the fans cheer for Weibel. And of course, I saw on the side of the Weibel side and would be with them whenever these waves were to touch down. I was like, this the ashes. <laughs> so the point is this. We cheer at football games. We should. I watched a good game last night on TV. Clemson uh, versus Texas, uh, Texas A&M. We should cheer. We should have fun. But, man, we should cheer for Jesus. I tell the youth all the time, man, I see y'all at the football games, I see you at the games, you're cheering, you're having fun, you can do that for Jesus. <laughs> right? Yeah. So let's uh, continue to cheer on Jesus through prayer this morning. Father, we thank you. God, thank you for being a God that reaches down from heaven, no matter background, social class, so forth. God, we all need redemption. And Lord, we thank you as your people this morning um, <clears throat> that you have redeemed us to live for your glory. And Father, we pray for the music, pray for Pastor Chip, that you would fill both with your Holy Spirit. Pray for the offering, God, that we would give according to your leadership. In Jesus' name, and God's people said, Amen. Amen.
preach and I should be fair to you as I was to the first service. <laughs> yes, right. yes. Well, the first service I forgot the next song, so I'm going to hit it this time. Okay? <laughs> That's what happens when your music director is out of town. <laughs> but we are thankful for our praise team and all that they do to serve. We do have uh, one more offering we do want to take up for Miss Angela. Our guys, they're coming with the plates now. And uh, we do want to be a blessing and uh, see this um, prayer garden and and I, hey, I hope you're already praying that as kids go by, that uh, it'll not only touch their life, but you know, the 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 Sunday before she died that week, she was on the altar right here, right there, on her knees. And um, I pray that they will see uh, the life she lived for Jesus. So. Uh, let's pray together. Father, bless this offering. Um, God, I pray as students at Central Middle School walk by there that, uh, God, you would just so intervene in their hearts and prick their hearts and stir their minds. God, as they see the life that she lived before them and that her son is there even as we speak with them uh, in this school year. And so, Father, I do pray, God, that uh, you would bless the gift and the giver. Um, God, that we could uh, see uh, your great love um, through her life. So blessed today as only you can in Jesus' name. Amen. And I do want to say again that uh, maybe you weren't prepared. We, we did this kind of um, short notice. But you can actually go to our church website, peacebc.org, and you can actually give through our website, or you can download our, our church app on your phone. You can give through there as well. Just if you give online or through the church app, just be sure to put Miss Angela's name in the other part. And that way we'll Miss Carol will know exactly where to uh, send that. Um, if you're a guest of ours, we have been going through the book of Matthew um, verse by verse. We've made our way up to chapter number 10. And so if you will go ahead and turn there to Matthew chapter 10, and we've made our way up to verse 34, and we're actually going to finish out um, the chapter for today. So we'll allow our children now to go back to Children's Church. If you are three years old through kindergarten, and you would like to go back to Children's Church today, you may do so at this time. <coughs> And we do want to say again, thank you for being our guest today, if today is your first visit with us. So Matthew chapter number 10, and we're going to get in verse number 34. So if you are physically eight, I'm going to ask you to stand for the reading of God's holy, infallible, inspired, inerrant word. And you'll find words similar to these. Jesus said, do not think that I came to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's enemies will be those of his own household. He who loves father and mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves his son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He who finds his life will lose it. And he who loses his life for my sake will find it. And he who receives you receives me. And he who receives me receives him who sent me. And he who receives a prophet in the name of, of, of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward. And he who receives a righteous man in the name of a righteous man shall receive a righteous man's reward. And whoever gives one of these little ones a cup of cold water in the name of a disciple, assuredly I say to you, he shall by no means lose his reward. Father, God, I pray you speak today as only you can. 
Change hearts, change lives, but I pray, Holy Spirit of God, do in this church, do in this people a work that only you can do. And Father, we'll be grateful for all that you have done and all that you're doing right now. And God, all that you're going to do, we give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. You know, the government spends millions upon millions upon millions of dollars every year in a campaign that will just say something about do not drink and drive. You see the ads on TV, you see the billboards everywhere you look. They do everything they can to educate people on not drinking and driving. And the idea is that if you're going to drink, find you a designated driver. Well, the person then agrees, well, I'm going to get high, I'm going to drink, I'm going to do what I want to do, regardless of what anybody says, but I'm going to re relinquish control of the vehicle to someone else so that, they can so that they can drive the car. Now, don't miss this. To be filled with the Holy Spirit of God is to relinquish control. And by the way, you can't be full of booze and Jesus at the same time. Y'all all right? Yeah, you, you can't be full of both. You're going to empty out one or the other and replace. And, and so that's what happens in so many lives in our day and time. Folks, we're either living by, uh, for Jesus or we're living for ourselves. Because this idea speaks of discipleship. It speaks of being governed by someone else. It speaks of being, being guided by someone else. And Jesus is actually speaking within the context of discipleship. And I will show you that here in just a moment. As a matter of fact, when you look at what Jesus is saying here, he is being totally honest. He is being upfront because if you go back early in chapter 10, what he's done is he has called 12 disciples to go and share the gospel in all the world. Now in doing that, when he called them, he didn't let them out on any kind of uh, hey, this is going to be a joy ride. This is going to be fun. This is going to be an exciting time. No, he lets them know you're going to be persecuted. He lets them know you're going to face tough times. You're going to go through valleys. You're going to go through mountaintops. But he absolutely lets them know that even to this scripture that we just read, hey, guess what? This might call you to be at odds with somebody even in your own household. If you follow me, there's a chance that there's going to be division even in your own home. And so he, be, he is being totally honest about what discipleship truly is. And he lets them know that following Christ and being a disciple of, of Christ is uncompromising. You cannot compromise any area of your life. Because here's the thing. If you compromise any area of your life, you compromise another area. And then you compromise another area. And then you compromise another area. And so he shows them exactly what to expect when it means to follow Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, he's already shown them what it looks like earlier in this chapter. Look at verse 34 with me again in chapter 10. Jesus said, do not think that I came to bring peace on earth. Hang on, let's stop right there. There's some people that will read that and say, hey, the Bible contradicts itself. I thought Jesus was going to be born as a baby and he was going to bring peace on earth. Well, absolutely. That was the original plan of God's plan. I'm going to send my son. He's going to bring peace on earth. But then the earth and the people thereof began to reject Jesus. And so after he is rejected, his love and his mercy and his grace has been rejected. All of a sudden, he says, wait a minute. I didn't just come to bring peace. I came to bring a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's enemies will be those even in his own home. Now, this language seems harsh. I don't know about you, but I read this and I'm thinking, he came to set me against my dad? Man, I love my dad. He came to set a daughter against a mother? Really? Really? Man, that seems kind of harsh. That seems kind of tough language that Jesus would lay out here. But the Jews that, that he was speaking to, they were very familiar with this language. They would understand everything that he was saying. It seems harsh, but they would know. Because here's the thing. 
Great things always divide people. Y'all all right? Y'all all right? Great things will always divide people. Football will divide people. <laughs> Something good will always divide people. And, and so the saddest thing is that division may take place even in our own homes and among our own friends. Jesus offers a choice to every single one of us to follow him. And you have that choice every single day of your life to follow him. And by the way, you just can't follow him on Sunday. You, you just can't show up to a building and say, well, I, I'm following Jesus. No, following Jesus and being a disciple of Jesus is living for Jesus every single day of your life, surrendering your life and living to him on a daily basis. And so when Jesus is addressing these people, he's letting them know, hey, guess what? Following me is going to be tough. You're going to have to face family who's not going to believe in me. What are you going to do then? And so all of a sudden something happens and the people reject the Lord Jesus. Now if you just remember, they just got through, that, uh, these people that Jesus is speaking to, they just got through calling him Satan on two different occasions. They were calling him the devil. They were rejecting him. Matter of fact, if you skip on over to chapter 12, they're going to call him Satan again. And if you finish out the book of Matthew, they lie on him and take him all the way to the cross and crucify him. Jesus said, when you follow me, don't expect a life of just tiptoeing through the tulips and everything's going to be a smile and everything's going to be great and everything's going to be awesome. Matter of fact, here they are calling him Satan. And let me tell you something, folks. To deny Jesus is to live in sin. People say, what sin will send you to hell? Any sin. <laughs> Doesn't matter. But especially the rejecting of the Holy Spirit of God moving and working in your lives on a daily basis. I, I don't know about y'all, but I would, I would rather be at war with my entire family than be at war with Jesus. I had, I, I'd rather be, and I love my family dearly. I love my wife and my children, my grandchildren. Man, I love my, my parents, my grandparents, my aunts, uncles, cousins. I love them deeply, but I had rather be at war with all of them than to be at war with Jesus Christ. And I can tell you this, folks. If you follow Jesus, you're going to be misunderstood. If you follow Jesus, you're going to be made fun of. If you follow Jesus, you're even going to be persecuted. And that's what Jesus is letting them know. Matter of fact, you kids that have just started back to, you students, you've all gone back to school now. Now is a prime time for you to go and live for Jesus in front of your school. But the problem is you'll come to go to summer camp and you'll come to church during the summer, you're not in school, and then all of a sudden you go back to school and something changes. I just went back to school. Now I'm going to live like everybody else in school. No, now's your chance to go back and live like Jesus. Y'all right? Is this thing even on? Y'all y'all act like y'all can't hear me this morning. Now's the time. That you can say, I'm going to show what it looks like to live for Jesus, no matter who it upsets, no matter what's going on in my life. And this may happen right in your own home. It may happen right in your own school. It may happen right where you work if you're going to, feel, if you're going to live with him because this is speaking of our witness. This is speaking of being controlled by him. If you just come here and act one way and then go out in the world and act another, you're not being controlled by Jesus. You're just being uh, having a banana peel on your one foot in heaven and a banana peel on one foot going to hell. That's just you're just trying to do a split between two worlds. But notice verse thirty-seven. He said, "That's what will take place in your home." But he who loves his father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and he who loves the son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Now somebody would look, read this and they would go, you know, Jesus is just trying to bring division to homes. No, he's trying to bring homes together through the cross. But, but I'm going to tell you this. There is no person walking this planet that I love more than that woman sitting right there. I don't, I, there's not, there's not a person walking this planet I love more than her. Yeah, not even you, Dave Grass. Absolutely not. <laughs> He's over there going, man, man. 
There's not. But if, I, if you make me choose between Jesus, who died on a cross for me, and he's my only way to heaven, it'd be, it'd be the toughest choice I'd ever have to make in my life. It would kill me to make that choice, but if you make me choose between my children, he, didn't, he wants me to show them the way, and guess what? That would be the way I would need to show them that he means more than anything else in my life. It's not that he's trying to bring division. He's trying to bring people together. And guess what would happen if some dads just stood up and said, guess what? I'm going to follow Jesus no matter what. What if some moms stood up and said, I'm going to follow Jesus no matter what. And some kids who would stand up and say, I don't care what my parents do. I'm going to follow Jesus every single day of my life. How much better would it be if we would just follow his plan and his purpose? But you know, notice what he said in verse 37. He who loves his father and mother more than me is not worthy of me. You know what Jesus' offer is to us? If you were to tell me I had to go out and drum up a, a, a way to get a bunch of people together to follow us, you, you know what we'd have to do? We'd have to buy Walmart gift cards. We'd have to buy some, there'd have to be some kind of gifts involved, some kind of money involved to get people to come and Oh, we need you to do this. We need you to do that. You know what Jesus said? Look at the next verse. <laughs> Look at verse 38. He said, and he, who, and he who does not take up his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. Does that make sense? I want you to follow me, but I'm going to give you a symbol of death to follow me. You... you you want me to follow something. You know, you think I've, I've got to buy, buy it. I've got to get money. I've got to. Jesus said, no. If you're going to follow me, you've got to take up your cross. You've you got you to pick that cross up. His offer is a cross. That's what discipleship is, is that you surrender your life to him and you follow him. You give him your life. And it's a symbol of death that he gives. Matter of fact, from church history, there was a Roman general. His name was Varus, and he crucified thousands of Jews along the side of the road. And, and he made them carry their cross to the spot that the cross would go up. You see, in our day and time, you and I think, well, I, 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 I pick up my cross, so I got me a little, I got a little cross here on my lapel. Or I'm wearing a necklace. I'm, I'm showing the, Jesus the world by wearing a necklace. Here, he's not talking about jewelry here, folks. He is showing something here greater and more than if we're going to give something up. It may be my personal desires is what, my, what may be picking up my cross, laying down the things that I want to do, the things that I want to, the people I want to impress, laying those things down, laying down my dreams and even my career, laying down my personal will, and even laying down my family and my friends. It's more than just wearing a, a piece of jewelry. Matter of fact, there's no room for personal safety in following Jesus. Wednesday night, we just had missionaries here from Bulgaria. There, there's a young man and a young woman who have taken a little girl and gone to Bulgaria to spend their lives. They're home on like a six-month furlough right now. And even had a baby while they're there. They have laid, hey, they, they took up their cross. They, they laid down their careers of everything that, that they wanted to do in life and everything their family expected of them. And they just said, we're going to follow Jesus, whatever that means, whatever that looks like. We're going to go. Hey, picking up a cross is not just wearing a piece of jewelry. It's the love of Jesus Christ and the love of the cross in confessing him and living in obedience to him and living every single day for him. There's no middle road. Warren Wiersbe said it best when he said, you'll either spare your life or sacrifice your life. You'll either be selfish or sacrificial. 
Let me tell you something, folks. God's called you and me. He has saved you and me to do so much more. And there's so much more to the Christian life, but we never obtain all that we can because we'll never live in a discipline. We'll never live in obedience. We'll always live in disobedience because it's a choice we make day in and day out. To serve him means so much more. So much more. Matter of fact, look in verse 40. He said, he who receives you receives me, and he who receives me receives him who sent me. He who receives a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward, and he who receives a righteous man in the name of a righteous man shall receive a righteous man's reward. And whoever gives out, gives one of these only a cup of cold water in the name of a disciple. Keep in mind, he's talking about discipleship. In the name of a disciple. Assuredly I say to you. He shall by no means lose. His reward. Folks. As Jesus was speaking this. And the audience that was listening to him. The Jews of that day and time. They would have totally understood. What he was saying. When he said these things about. A reward. They, they would have, this would have been familiar language to them. To receive somebody. In the name of. Of somebody else. As a matter of fact, if you study Jewish history, they believed that to receive a person or even an envoy of people or even a messenger was to actually receive that person himself. It'd be like me saying, David, I need you to go over to so and so's house. And when they got there, that person would receive David, they would be receiving me as well. If I said to this entire side of the room, I need you to go to such and such and go. And when you get there to those people, that people would receive this entire group in my name because I'm the one who sent them. And they would welcome them in and they would, they would receive a reward because of what they've done in receiving that person. Folks, it's a picture of love. It's a picture of adoration. It's a picture of respect. It's a picture of honor that Jesus is trying to show these people. And these people were rejecting Jesus. Jesus said, I'm here on behalf of my father. But you reject me over and over and over. And guess what? When you go out these doors and you go to people's houses and you go into your workplace and you go into your school, there's probably people who's going to reject you as well. Now, I wish y'all could have been in the early service. Because <laughs> there was a man here that uh, Friday before last, David Phipps, had a burden on his heart. There were some men we met on a Friday morning. He said, we need to go. <coughs> we need to go see Terry Carter. I said, okay. He said, man, we just got a burden. We got to go. And so me and David and Brandon Patrick, we rode over to, to Terry's home. And we just got to talking to him. And Terry had said, he said, I've been sitting here crying all morning long. He said, I've just been in a mess and I, I, I just don't know what to do. And I, I, he said, I'm just telling you. And so I finally looked at Terry and I said, Terry, if you die today, do you know 100% you can go to heaven? He said, well, I'm 99% sure. And I said, well, you're 100% going to hell now. If you can't say you know Jesus, because the Bible says in 1 John more than 30 times that you can know. Not that you might be or you hope to be saved. And Terry fell out of his chair on his knees and said, guys, let's pray. And I thought we were getting ready to leave him. He fell out on the floor and he began to pray. God saved him. God forgive me of all my sins. He was here this morning in the early service. He was here. And he took the microphone and stood before the church. And he said, somebody came to my house. Those guys, and he named all three of us that went to his house. Because we went in Jesus' name. And he received Jesus' name. But you know, there, there's something you don't know, may, may not know about Terry. Just a couple of years ago, his son got killed in a car wreck. Earlier, uh, earlier this year, Terry um, had some infection in his brain and almost died in Chapel Hill. Um, 
Matter of fact, he had said he family told him he had died. And it said that when he woke up, first words out of his mouth was praise the Lord. So he lost his son, he lost his health. Well, his wife didn't work because he made such good money and then he couldn't make good money now that he's in the hospital and may, uh, maybe head towards disability. Don't work. And so he lost his home. So he lost his son. It's like a modern day Job. Lost his health, lost his wealth. And he's living in a camp for him and his wife. And he said, you know what? God's taking such good care of me. Folks, if we would put life in perspective and only see it where what God's trying to do and how God's trying to minister. But God needs me and you to be his hands and feet to be disciples to go out and share. And if you notice the verses that we've just read, verses 40 through 42, he mentions reward after reward after Guess what? The rewards don't have to end. You can keep building rewards Keep putting stars in your crowns and jewels in your crown and you can still keep working. It's multiple rewards you can keep building. If you just receive this person and you receive that person and you go in my name. It's what discipleship looks like because if you notice in verse 42, and whoever gives one of these little ones uh, only a cup of cold water in the name of a disciple. He's talking about discipleship. What a picture of the church and what it ought to be. It reminds me of a story I'd heard about many years ago about this village cobbler, shoemaker. He uh, noticed this young boy in the village that they lived in. This, this young boy was trying to surrender his life to God and surrendering his life to, to ministry. And this cobbler just had his heart and mind. He said, I, I want to help the shoemaker. He's struggling to, to try to do the right thing in his life, and I want to help him. And so he invited this young boy into his home, and he invited him into his shop, and he just began to mentor this young boy. And as this young boy grew to be a young man, he finally surrendered to preach. And on the day that he was to be uh, licensed to preach, that cobbler, the little old man, went to him and he said these words. He said, it was always my desire to be a preacher of the gospel. But the circumstances of my life made it impossible. But you are achieving what was closed to me. And I want you to promise me one thing. I want you to allow me to make your shoes for free. He said, I want you to wear the shoes that I make for you when you preach in the pulpit. And when you preach, then I'll feel like I'm the one preaching. Because I've never had the opportunity. And it'll be as if you're standing in my shoes. You know what? That cobbler received a young boy. He received God. <laughs> but he also received the blessing of investing in somebody else's life. Anybody in here know who Edward Kimball is? <coughs> Edward Kimball? Yeah, if you were in the first service, you did. Edward Kimball. He got a burden on his heart for a young boy named Dwight L. Moody. <coughs> and in a shoe store, he goes and he shares the gospel with this young man who became Dwight L. Moody. Moody Bible College in Chicago is still there today. And through Moody's influence, a man named Wilbur Chapman got saved. He became a preacher. And through his influence, there was another man, a professional baseball player by the name of Billy Sunday, who gave up his professional baseball career to become a preacher of the gospel. They said when Billy Sunday would go into a town that bars would shut down when he would start preaching. He had that much influence. But then it was through the influence of Billy Sunday that Mordecai Ham got saved. Mordecai Ham was preaching in Charlotte, North Carolina in a tent revival when a little 
scrawny, skinny, teenage young man named Billy Graham. It started in a shoe store with a Sunday school teacher who just got a burden to just start a discipleship process that has literally now touched billions of people around the world. And Jesus said, all it takes is that you, all you got to do is surrender to me. And all it takes is that you love me more than you love anybody else. It don't mean I go home and me and my wife has a disagreement and I kick her out. No. It don't mean that, that we're going to see th always see things eye to eye. He said, all I'm asking is that you love me more than you love anybody else. What, what matters more is that, is that you follow me and not somebody else. What matters is that you follow me and not the crowd at school. What, what matters is that you follow me and not the crowd at work. He said, I came to die for you. But I want you to know that discipleship is costly. Maybe you're here today and you say, well, I can't do that. And the reason you can't do that is because you're not saved yourself. You've never truly come to the place where you say, God, I'm a sinner. Please forgive me. You know when it's real for somebody, when they get saved on a Friday and a, a week and a half later, they stand up in front of the church with a microphone and says, hey, Terry stood right here this morning with tears pouring off his face. How God had saved him. And how he was grateful somebody went and knocked on his door. Maybe, maybe you can't do that because you, you've never done that. You've never surrendered. Maybe you say, well, I prayed a prayer one time. What, what, what's happened since the prayer? How's your life changed since you prayed the prayer? What, what's your life look like since you prayed the prayer? So in other words, so what that you pray the prayer if you're not living it? That's what Jesus is trying to teach these disciples as he's sending them out. If you're going out in my name, you've got to live it. Maybe you're here today and you're already saved, but you say, you know what, I've, I've not been doing that. I've not been receiving people and sharing the gospel. And I want to start doing that, and I want to start living a life of obedience. Maybe some of you kids, you've already gone back to school and you've already fallen back into the rut of being in school and being with a crowd that's going to get you in trouble. Instead of being a leader and standing up and saying, I, I need to do something different with my life. Maybe there's some adults here that need to do the same thing. I want to be a leader in my workplace for Jesus, regardless of what people say about me. You know what gets me? I didn't care what people thought about me when I was drunk and passed out somewhere. Why am I going to care that I'm following Jesus now? Y'all right? I didn't care what they thought about me when I was laid over there looking stupid, drunk and passed out. Why would I care that I'm following, that I'm following the King of Kings, what they thought now? It's the most important thing I can show them. Maybe you're here today and you just heard there's things going on at home and work. You just say, I just, I just need some relief. <coughs> Maybe you want somebody to pray with you. I'll pray with you. There's ladies out there and pray with you. Maybe you're here today and you want to join this church. Whatever need you have, this altar is going to be open. I'm going to ask you to stand with us. You come. Wherever you're at, you come. Come and surrender.